folks, I am so excited to be here today with a good friend of the Psych Sessions podcast, Dr. David Myers from Hope College. And I approached Dave because I wanted to talk to him about a new book that is, depending on when you're hearing this, either about to come out or has already come out. So Dave, welcome back and thanks for taking the time. I'm honored. I've always had fun talking to you, Garth. Yeah, well, uh, we have had uh, fun, uh, and it's been very meaningful that you've sat down with us twice. Folks, if you've never heard the other two interviews uh, with Dave, please go back and check them out, but not before you finish this, because I am really excited about this. Uh, Dave, you are publishing another book. Now, would we call this a trade book? Is I, I don't know the lingo. Is it a trade book? Correct. Correct. Okay. A t- trade book is the word for a general audience book. As opposed to uh, something that's either highly technical uh, for an industry or a textbook. Right. Um, Which you may know one or two things about. Um, So tell me, um, how many of these trade books have you written over the course of your career? Oh, maybe half a dozen or so. Okay. And um, On 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 the scientific pursuit of happiness, on the powers and perils of intuition, about the psychology of hearing loss, about uh, and the, the Christian case for gay marriage. Uh, I mean, those are all kind of general audience books. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, and by the way, I'm just, thank you for sending this copy to me. By the way, this is just one of the perks of knowing Dave Myers is uh, that he sent me a, uh, a copy of the new book, How Do We Know Ourselves? I just got it. I'm so excited. I was telling my wife about it, Dave, and Danielle said, would I like that book? And she, I said, absolutely. After I looked through it, I just, I realized that this is accessible to anyone. It, it should Thank be, you. right? Well, that's the idea. Uh, and that what the book offers are 40 little bite-sized nuggets, uh, essays you could read on the bus ride, for example, that uh, take some of our disciplines surprising or fascinating findings about the human mind or about human behavior and uh, tries to communicate them with uh, playful uh, prose. And so it was great fun for me to write, and I hope it'll be fun for people to read. Yeah, well, I know in our house we are going to be reading these. I mean, the the titles themselves of these chapters, just I think depending on who you are, they're just going to jump off the page. I, I don't know if I'll end up reading this in order, but I, I'll try to read it in order, Dave, but is it meant to be read in order or can I just pick and choose? No, you can read them in any order. I love it. I, right. I love it. And There's by the no way, sequence. I, I, um, your books are, um, they are mentioned. All of your, your titles are mentioned in the first few pages of the book. I know the publishers do that. I'll probably make you blush if I, read all of them but they um it's it's been an amazing writing career and contribution and i'm so glad that you're still putting these out so yes let's talk about the book because i have a few questions for you um i don't know where to start but here here's what sticks out to me as i look at this book um is that there are the book is how do we know ourselves and then there are three parts can you just talk about the three parts real quick and then i have a follow-up question well, really, they, they, it was the editor that created the, the three parts, if you want to know the honest truth. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't. For me, there are 40 independent little essays, uh, musings on uh, 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 report psychological re- revelations, snapshots of our fields, expanding discoveries and their relevance to everyday life. That's that's what it is. Okay, so I mean, this is this is on point for you. It's psychology in everyday life. It's very applied. It's science based. It's evidence based. Um, I noticed this is not an APA style, so that people don't have to worry about reading over parentheses, right? You put those all in the front. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> yeah. So there are endnotes. If you go to the back, everything's sourced. But uh, one of my pet peeves, as I think may you may know, is that. You know, I don't think APA referencing style really is well suited to textbooks, but it's what so many instructors expect that we give it. Oh, you know, Dave, I didn't know that. But this is one of those those things in a list of things that um, I think publishers give to faculty because it's always been that way. Not that it's the best way to do it, but we ask for it. And so it's done that way. Um, With my social psych text, the first edition, I did it with like little notes, just numbered notes that would reference the study at the bottom of the page and then the bibliography in the back. 
And somebody raised a question about that. This violates APA style, which we're teaching our students. And so my editor and I agreed that we put that referencing style out to our book seven reviewers and then abide by their verdict. And six of them, six of the seven came back and said, you've got to have APA style with those little visual hurdles that the eye has to leap. And so I conceded. Because that I, was the deal. I think it's well, a terrible idea, but it's what's wrong. It's what's wrong with all textbooks, including mine. <laughs> well, you know, I appreciate that, Dave, because I have students who are underprepared for community college and they come in and it's it honestly can be a barrier to them uh, when reading uh, fundamentally right. is a struggle um, and an academic reading at that. Um, so let's let's I won't get us too far off the uh, the course here, but. Talk to me about um, where did these, so these are just, as you said, they're a couple pages long, sometimes two or three pages, and they are uh, your thoughts, your musings on various topics. Tell me, where did these, how many of these did you have that you had already written, and how many of them did you write just for the book? Obviously, sure. there's editing so, involved. Uh, there are 40 essays, 22 came from my blog, TalkSite.com. Not exactly, but they're at least adapted from that. And then 18 are original to this book. And often we're on topics that the editor encouraged me to write about, taking psychological science uh, that I do report on in my text and repackaging it for a general audience. Great. Um, so at some point you had the idea or the publisher had the idea that these, are, these should be uh, uh, combined as a book, I guess. Right. I mean, so... Uh, some of my favorite books have been like books of essays by Carl Sagan or Lewis Thomas. And I thought, could these essays that I'm doing potentially make a book? And I put the idea out there and one person said, no, you know, people who are reading online blogs now, they're really not reading books of essays. But I put it to the literary agent who represented my happiness book. And he said, oh, sure. Books of essays are still selling. Let me let me see if I can place it. So he put it out to Farrar, Strauss and Giroux and they immediately took it. So here we are. The book I is love published it. November 1st. Well, can I just tell you to the folks that they or you uh, got to review the book? I'm just looking on the back sleeve here. This is unbelievable. I'll just tell folks uh, here are the folks who reviewed it on the back of Dave's book. Uh, Angela Duckworth, uh, author of Grit, Marty Seligman, um, Jonathan Haidt. And Steven Pinker were all reviewers of this <laughs> book, and they had such glowing things. By the way, some of those folks are some of my favorite, I don't know, thought architects. And so um, I just, I am, I was so impressed, and I thought, I'm in good company if I like Dave and these folks. Oh, do thank too. you so much. Oh, yeah. thank you. I, I, they are indeed four of the great public intellectuals of our discipline. And I've been privileged to, at least in, uh, in, in, in ways more or less to get to know each of them. And so each of them were kind enough to respond to my invitation to have a look at the manuscript. I love it. Uh, well, um, are there any, I know these are like children, you probably can't um, maybe pick just one, but um, are there any favorite chapters that uh, before, I'm going to ask you two questions, actually. I'm going to ask you about relevant chapters to kind of today's day and age, but are there any ones that you, uh, first of all, before we get to that, are there any chapters that you just loved writing about in particular? Sure. So I, I just use as one example, uh, the essay on what I call the happy power of micro friendships. And this particular essay was really just reporting on some recent research by Nick Epley, a social psychologist at the University of Chicago and others, which in which uh, he and other researchers have done this in other places. Uh, induce people with a monetary incentive to either like on a train or commuter ride, bus ride, do as they would normally do, or in another condition to sit silently, or in a third condition to strike up a conversation with a stranger. People think that's going to be terribly awkward. In fact, they end the bus ride or the train ride in a really happy mood. And so is likewise is the person to whom they talk. And this has also been found when among people who are induced to banter with a barista 
or give a compliment to a stranger on the sidewalk or to talk up a Turkish bus driver. And these experiments are all finding that I mean, it's very heartwarming. And what I did, by the way, is take these experiments and then in a Facebook post, put it out to my friends. Have you had this experience? And I got these amazing stories back from people who have had chance encounters uh, on the street and had their hearts warmed by doing so. So it, it's a happy chapter and it's a happy science of micro friendships. It's so good. Uh, I've had that experience, certainly. And I'm glad that there is uh, research to back it up because uh, it is so important to being human to be able to say and share those kinds of things and those moments with folks. Um, and so, again, this uh, this book, these chapters uh, are applied to everyday life. I think they uh, help us to kind of learn about thriving and happiness. And you've obviously been talking about that for a long time. Other chapters that stick out to you? Well, another one that comes to mind, just kind of on the other side, maybe the more negative side of things, is uh, the human tendency to fear the wrong things. And so there's an essay on why we fear the wrong things. And it has examples of our fearing the wrong things. So my longtime favorite example is people fear flying more than driving, although mile per mile in the last decade, we've been 501 times more likely to die in a car accident than in an airplane. So when I fly to Seattle, where you are, uh, Garth, uh, the most anxious part of my journey is the drive to my airport. Once I'm in the loving care of Delta Airlines, all's well. I know that because I think statistically, but most people don't. They think in terms of available images of disasters. And a more recent example of people fearing the wrong things, which is something people commonly do, comes from COVID. So, for example, in the Gallup World Poll of more than 100,000 people, 39% of people early in the epidemic over 65 were worried about their health under COVID. That was a reasonable fear. But among those 18 to 29 who had 1%, the fatality rate of those over 65, even slightly more, 40% were afraid of COVID. Uh, likewise, more recently, we've seen that in national surveys, fully vaccinated people, vaccinated, boosted and everything, are more afraid of COVID on average than our unvaccinated people. That makes no sense. I mean, that's just we're fearing the people that should be reassured are afraid and the people that should be afraid are cavalier. Uh, we're fearing the wrong things. And those are just two examples. And, and, and there's many other examples of how we don't think statistically. We fear terrorist shootings in our local school. And if you look at the statistical improbability of that compared to the risks of guns in the home or driving to school or anything else, uh, you realize our fears are really in the wrong place. And so part of smart, critical thinking for us and for our students is aligning our thinking, including our fears, with factual statistical reality. Dave, I always appreciated this about you, about your talks. I've heard you uh, mention things like this before. And particularly, I like how you don't uh, go away from politics much. I I know that you you can use um, psychological science to make both sides seem or feel a little bit uncomfortable right. because you show what the data actually says. And um, I always find that fascinating. I appreciate that you do it because we all need to have a mirror held up every once in a while uh, when we can be so so uh, biased um, and, and maybe right. not thinking critically um, all the time. So I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Um, all right. Are other chapters that you want to talk about before we uh, maybe chapters that are, you think are really relevant to the time that we are in? Um, and I not like those aren't, but. Well, there are other essays on how our differences from other people seize our attention, not our common, not our commonalities or chapters in which I or little essays in which I uh, apply group polarization to the incredible polarization of today. I study group polarization long ago as my doctoral research and then as my research for the first decade of my career. But now we see group polarization on steroids, thanks to social media, thanks to cable television and so forth, allowing us to seek out like mind and allowing people within the tribe to amplify their sentiments. And so I have you know examples of this. So I think some of the psychological science is certainly pertinent to the culture that we live in today as well as the misinformation and conspiracy thinking and all the rest. How do you uh, 
when you find, you know, we talked about some positive finding, we've talked about some troubling findings uh, from psychological science. When you find the more troubling ones or the harder, the ones that are a little harder for folks to swallow, maybe they're, they confront a little more. Um, how have you approached that? How do you tend to approach that in your writing and, and in your talks as well? Well, I think my fundamental obligation uh, as an author, and I think it's the fundamental ob obligation that as teachers we all share, is to discern and give witness to truth. So above all, our obligation is to tell the truth. It's not to make people feel comfortable, although we do want to make people feel comfortable and happy. We care about well-being and human flourishing. But our business is truth-telling. It's discerning. And that's not to say we always get it right, but at least that is our aim. And so that's what I want to do. But then secondly, I want to do it in a way that somebody can can hear and understand and and not feel defeated or depressed by it. you know there needs to be a measure of hope where there is hope too yeah thanks for that um i'm thinking about how this book can be read as, as an individual i'm going to find this uh fascinating to just read cover to cover but as i said at the beginning of this it's going to be the conversations too that my wife and i have around these topics i think that are going to be really fun and um because I think there are a lot of insights that we can get into just how we live our lives, as you've already discussed, um, you know, that things that make us uh, tend to make us happier and things that tend to be barriers in our happiness or the way that we see the world truthfully, uh, maybe or without bias. Um, how do you how have you foreseen kind of folks engaging with this book? Uh, have you thought about groups? Have you thought about classroom? Have you thought about um, you know, what kind of an impact this makes upon people uh, as they're reading it. Any any of those things um, no, resonate? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I, I don't think it's necessarily a book you have to sit down and read straight through. I mean, it's not like a novel. No. I mean, so you can, you can take it in bits. I mean, you could leave it in the bathroom. It's that kind of book. You could take it on the bus. Uh, uh, you could have it at the beach and just and take it in the small bits, the bite sizes that it, that it has. I do, maybe if I have a fantasy, it would be that teachers of psychology uh, who have students who are loving reading about psychology, this might be a nice gift book for them by their yeah. parents or somebody could, who'd like to go beyond and do some fun reading that stretches their mind. It, and for other people who've taken psychology long ago, and I had an email from somebody to whom I've given the book for whom this was her experience. It kind of recalls things she once knew, but had kind of forgotten and teaches her things that are new to psychological science she never knew about. So um, I, I'm hoping it might do that for people and just might be a fun read. So, I mean, I had fun writing it. I mean, I laugh sometimes and you'll <laughs> see uh, in some of the er particularly the earlier essays. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know if people will find the jokes as funny as I do, but uh, uh, at, at least nobody's going to have fun reading if I don't have fun writing. <laughs> yeah, well, I love some of the titles. How do I love me? Let me count the ways. Uh, that's right, a great title. Right, yeah. Right. And uh, how about um, how politics change? How politics changes politicians? That's a good one. Or I'm thinking about my 10 year old daughter right now when I see this one friends versus phones. I should probably oh, be yes. thinking about myself, but I do have a 10 year old. Right. Home, so. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that was an, ex an essay that was stimulated by a couple, by an experience and then by some research. The experience was being in the, uh, the office of an NBC producer some years ago trying to have a conversation with her at her invitation. And she kept getting uh, phone messages that would come in. So she would talk to me for a minute or two, and then she would turn and deal with her phone. Then she'd come back to me, and then she would turn and deal with her phone. And it was so kind of rude, I thought. And now we have research on what's called phone snubbing, for which the word is fubbing. Uh, <laughs> and so we've all had the experience of being fubbed, of being phone snubbed by somebody we're having a conversation with, and suddenly we lose their attention. And so how do you deal with that? And so th there are practical ways to deal with that, of having people deposit their phones in a basket if they're all out to dinner so that they can't be checking their phones when they're supposed to be tuned in into each other. So anyway, you know, just and, another example where there's some research that connects with our everyday experience. In my life, um, that fubbing doesn't uh, do very well in my my marriage relationship. And so oh, I, yeah, I've yeah. learned to put that phone in the basket. I see you rolling your eyes, uh, too. So Tell me about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> 
Hey, a uh, very, very sweet note at the front of your book. Uh, you dedicate your this book to your wife, Carol, who has been with you through all of this writing over the decades. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so and uh, uh, we, we, that- we married while we were undergraduates and I turned 80 last month. So it's been a long journey. Yeah, we we all saw you playing basketball on Facebook uh, for your 80th birthday. (laughs) That was nice to see. Well, hey, um, all our best from Psych Sessions to your family and to your work, the David and Carol Myers Foundation and everything that you're doing. I don't know how you you. keep it, keep doing it, Dave, but it's, uh, you know, keep pumping it out because we love it. Thank you. And 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 I should it might encourage you and some listeners to know that all the royalties from this book are, are going to the teaching of psychology via either the APS fund for the teaching and public understanding of psychological science or to APF to support teachers of high school psychology. Yeah, folks. So um, let me just so it's a fundraiser you. for teaching. <laughs> well, let me encourage everyone who's listening, go and grab this book. You won't regret it. I think I think it's actually a perfect Christmas gift, Dave. Um, People are going to just love to pick up this book and read. It's fascinating. Uh, What I have looked at in the opening chapters is really, really great. I've loved reading your blog forever. And remind us of that blog address again. It's 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 talkpsych.com. Talkpsych, one word, dot com. Talkpsych.com. Dave, any final thoughts you want to leave us with, or did we pretty much cover it? We pretty much cover it, and you're right. The publisher did time this book, which could have come out earlier, to be pre-Christmas. Love it. I love it. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time, Dave, and uh, we'll look forward to what's next. Okay. Thank you so much, Garth. I appreciate your support of Teachers of Psychology. Mm -hmm. 